Good morning, everyone. I'd like to welcome you all to today's webinar, Basic Counseling Skills for an Independent Educational Consultant. This session is being recorded, and the recording will be available within 24 hours. If you registered through Extension's free events website, you will automatically receive an email with a link to the archive. If for some reason you do not receive the email, you can access the recording manually by going to uci.webex.com, clicking on the Event Center tab, and then clicking on View Event Recordings. This presentation will be listed with other recordings, so you would simply need to search for this webinar's title. And I'll probably be sending out the link to this recording if you registered through the free events website. I'll be sending that out by tomorrow afternoon. So again, if you don't receive the email, you can go ahead and access the archive by following these directions. My name is Lisa Kotowaki, and I'm a program manager here at UC Irvine Extension. Here's a brief outline of what we're going to cover in this webinar session. First, I'll start off with a quick overview of WebEx features, so you'll know how to submit questions throughout the presentation. Next, I'll be giving you some information about UCI Extension's Independent Educational Consultant Certificate Program, which is a fully online program. I will cover the requirements, fees, and details regarding upcoming courses for our summer quarter, which begins June 30th. I will then turn it over to our guest presenter, Jennifer Mandel, President of College Right, and also an instructor in our certificate program, who will be teaching the Developing an IEC Business course in the fall. At the end of Jennifer's presentation, we will have a brief Q&A session. Finally, I'll leave you with my contact information so that you can send us any additional questions that we didn't address. If you encounter any technical difficulties during the webinar today, please send a chat message over to UCI John, and he will help you troubleshoot any issues. If you have a question for Jennifer regarding the content of this presentation, please submit it in the chat panel, and we'll address it at the end if we have time. So if you look on the right-hand side of your screen, um, you should see a chat panel. If not, you'll want to look at the icons. There should be an icon for participants and then a chat bubble icon. Go ahead and click on that chat bubble icon and the chat panel should appear. So if you have any questions throughout the presentation, feel free to submit them in the chat panel. You will want to make sure that you send in the send to. You'll want to make sure that it says host, presenter, and panelist, and that will ensure that both myself and Jennifer receive your questions. Jennifer will also be uh, posing questions to all of the attendees throughout her presentation. So when she asks for um, audience participation, you will want to go ahead and submit your answers in the chat panel. Here's a brief overview of the Independent Educational Consultant Certificate Program. Our program provides the knowledge and skills needed to fully understand the college admissions process and how to meet the needs of varied clients. Our program is developed and taught by industry experts and accomplished educational consultants. And you'll require, acquire the basic skills required to start, open, and expand a successful and ethical educational consulting business. Our program is designed for a number of audiences. Currently, we have individuals who have transitioned into the college admissions consulting profession from other careers like high school counseling or administration, individuals looking to develop their business model and marketing plan in order to launch their own private practice, and we also have people who are already practicing IECs but are looking for professional development opportunities. Our certificate program is composed of five required courses and two electives, which add up to seven courses or 15 units total. To be eligible for this certificate, students must complete all seven courses with a letter grade of C or better, as well as the completed declaration of candidacy. Since there is a small candidacy fee, I usually advise students to take a few classes before they apply, just to make sure that they do want to complete the full certificate program. As I mentioned before, our certificate program consists of seven online courses. The five required courses are listed on this slide below. 
We have Principles of Educational Consulting, Navigating the Financial Aid Network, College Admissions Consulting Resources, Developing an Independent Educational Consulting Business, and the Independent Educational Consulting Practicum. You do want to be, pay close attention to the unit value of each course, which is listed in parentheses, because this dictates how long each course will last. For example, you can expect a two-unit course to last seven weeks online and a 2.5-unit course to last eight weeks online. We highly recommend that new students take the Principles of Educational Consulting course during their first quarter. There is a prerequisite for the practicum course, which is noted here on the slide. You must complete all other required courses before enrolling in the practicum. We also offer a number of very interesting electives, working with students with learning differences, marketing and PR for the educational consultant, introduction to therapeutic consulting, consulting transfer summer and gap year students, social media for the independent educational consultant, and American College Consulting for the international student. Now, because elective courses focus on more specific topics, You'll notice that each elective course has a smaller unit value than the required courses. The electives are 1.5 units and will run for five or six weeks online. In the upcoming summer quarter, we will be offering all of the required courses in the program. Each course is listed here with its start and end date, as well as the online course fee of $675 per course. Please be sure to register early to reserve your spot in the course. In addition to the required courses, here are the three elective courses that are being offered in summer 2014. Working with students with learning differences, marketing and PR for the educational consultant, and American College Consulting for the international student. Again, the start and end dates of each class are listed as well as the online fee of $675. The course schedule and enrollment information are also posted on our website. And enrollment is currently open, so you may enroll either online or, or by calling our Student Services Office at the number provided. Again, I do want to stress that courses in this program, they do fill up quickly, so please make sure that you register early. Okay, and I see some questions coming in um, in my chat panel. If you are having any technical difficulties or audio problems, please be sure to send your uh, chat message to UCI John, and he can help you out with any technical issues you may be having. All right, each course in our program costs $675, so you're looking at $4,725 in course fees for the seven online courses. Now, you don't pay the entire total up front. You simply pay for each course individually at the time of enrollment. There is also a $125 certificate candidacy fee for the program, so in the end, you're looking at a total of $4,850. Please note that amount does not include textbooks, which some courses may require. Textbook information is posted on the enrollment page, so you'll know if course materials are required before you enroll in a class. Here's a screenshot of the certificate page on our website. There is a lot of information about our program requirements and course offerings on this page, so I do encourage you to visit it. And I also wanted to point out the section that goes over the discount that we provide to members of the IECA. Members are given a 10% discount on courses within UCI Extension's Independent Educational Consultant Certificate Program. And completion of our certificate program also satisfies the experience requirement for associate membership in the IECA. If you have any membership questions or to receive the discount code if you are already a member, please contact the IECA membership office directly. And this is just a screenshot of our certificate um, program brochure. 
If you don't have a brochure, you can also download it off of our website. Similar to our website, the brochure contains just general information about the program and also course descriptions. When viewing the course schedule online, um, and that the grid is pictured here in the lower right hand corner of the slide, you'll notice that not all classes are offered every quarter, so please plan accordingly. All right, at this time I'd like to hand over the presenter ball to our guest speaker, Jennifer Mandel, so that she can provide an introduction and begin her portion of the presentation. Thanks, Lisa. Good morning and good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, I'm really looking forward to going over this topic with you um, and also <clears throat> getting your feedback on a few things as we um, discuss this together. So the first thing is I want to um, pull up the next slide so you can learn a little bit about me here on, the, um, on, on this particular page. When I started um, my company, College Right, um, in January of 2009. I, I had been working in the industry already, and I started my own practice because I wanted to provide a more personal experience, uh, a, a more boutique-like experience for my students and their parents. And what I've learned um, by being in this field over the, over the last 11 years, and specifically um, in the last five and a half now as a business owner and an educational consultant is that you know providing an excellent experience um, for our students is of course 50% college admissions guidance um, and also 50% creating an environment where both the student and the parents feel supported and and I really feel like it's this la that this latter 50% that's so so subtle and and so nuanced yet essential um, to being a successful independent educational consultant and and so that's what I want to focus on with you here today now I know at the beginning um, of the hour you filled out that poll um, for us and thank you for doing that um, but I'd like to know specifically from each of you who are here today listening if you currently have an IEC practice um, or if you're or if you're working uh, with someone else not in your own practice or for, for someone else so if you have in any way shape or form been working as an IEC let us know in the chat box and let us also know if you're not currently an IEC what brings you here today this is going to help me make sure that I'm that I'm tailoring um, the information to the audience so we get um, so I get as much good information from you as possible. I'm going to pull up my screen and again here and submit, look at everything. Oh, go ahead. Sorry, submit go the ahead. answers um, in the chat panel. You'll want to go ahead and make sure. First of all, it's open on your screen, and then you'll want to make sure that you send your responses to the host, presenter, and panelist. So that'll make sure that both Jennifer and myself um, see your responses. Now you, I don't believe you'll be able to see responses from other individuals, but Jennifer, as she sees your answers coming in, she'll be able to get a better idea and summarize and share that with the audience. Great, thank you. This is great, you guys. I'm just gonna take a few more, a few more moments here and just, um, there we go. Okay, this is great. Okay, so a lot of you are already in practice as an IEC. A lot of you are just starting and have no experience at all. Wonderful, wonderful. Okay, great. Some of you are working to open up a specialized um, practice for certain topics in the industry. Great. Let me just take one more moment. Wonderful. Okay. Great, okay. Yeah. Upward bound, There's, I see an upward bound advisor here. Wonderful, all right. Okay, well let's get started. I finished my cup of coffee, so, and it looks like everyone has um, supplied a fantastic answer, thank you. <laughs> so, 
let's let's take a look at where we are today as educational consultants um, or IECs, and you'll hear me use that term um, throughout the the session today. So, you know, anyone who opens up a newspaper or an internet or an online newspaper or turns the TV on, um, particularly in the months of March and April, will hear, you know, how much harder it is to get into college today. Um, we hear that application numbers um, are just increasing exponentially um, for, from kids who are applying to college and specifically students who are applying for the early action and early decision programs at colleges. Um, those numbers are just um, just increasing exponentially as well. Um, and particularly for the admission cycles for this graduating class of 2014, these, these are just, you know, continuing to be scary high. And as a result, acceptance rates that we're finding now continue to be scary low at most of these schools. <clears throat> and because the majority of colleges and universities now um, you subscribe to the common application, which we all know. Submitting one application to multiple colleges has become really easy for a high school student. You know, you can essentially press submit once and it will go to as many colleges as, as are on the common application, for example. And so as a result of this, um, ease for the student, it's actually become much more difficult for colleges who subscribe to something like the common application to predict their yield. And yield is a pretty common term um, in the admissions industry, but I have it right below um, the screen, on the bottom of the screen rather, for you to understand that this is the percentage of admitted students who actually enroll in a college. So determining which students who apply will actually say yes to me at my university is becoming a much more difficult thing now because it is so easy for a student to apply to college. We're also seeing, you know, record-breaking numbers of applications um, becoming essentially commonplace at not just the Ivies, but also at, you know, at about 50 to 80 highly selective colleges and universities as well. So I have this statistic here on the screen that you'll see about Brown University <clears throat> and, and what, a, what an incredible ratio that is. And I'm also sure that most of us have, you know, heard about Stanford's rate in the last week or so being at about only a 5% rate of acceptance, which is pretty unbelievable. We haven't seen a statistic that low, you know, that I can remember um, in the last 11 or even 12 years. And so what's also contributing to today's admissions landscape is the fact that our school counselors um, typically have really, really high caseloads of students. And so I have an average number up here for us on the screen according to the American School Counselor Association. <clears throat> and, you, and you'll see that as a result, it's very difficult and it's becoming increasingly difficult for our in-school counselors to give each of their students a, a personalized, you know, one-on-one -on -one approach to both their college research and their college application process. So um, this moment, this particular moment in college admissions is really exciting for those of you who are continuing to grow your practices and also those of you who are here today who are interested in becoming an independent educational consultant. I found these, these numbers really, really interesting <clears throat> um, up here on the screen. You can see that from 2005 to 2012, the number of people who are moving into educational consulting is increasing dramatically. <coughs> Excuse me. The third bullet point I have here up on the screen um, you know, is IECA, which is um, one of the professional organizations that you can be a part of if you're an independent educational consultant. It's a wonderful organization. I'm a part of it. <laughs> um, but now we have members in 21 countries. What I also think is, is so interesting and also why I think right now is a really exciting time to become an IEC is that more and more of us are now making this an actual full-time or even full-time plus <laughs> um, career. 
being an expert on college admissions and being an expert in guiding your students through the college process is now, more than ever, really a full-time job and depending upon the type of year the time of year rather it is more more than a full-time job it's a sleep in your office type of job if it's the month of September and October um, and so I think that was a really interesting interesting statistic so for, for those of us who are new or relatively new or even thinking about getting into this business let's talk about you know who we are you're gonna get that question a lot if you haven't already <laughs> still so you know we offer college guidance to high school students and their parents who kind of realize um, at some point in the high school career that the student needs more specific individual attention than maybe a school counselor will have time to provide. Our friends who are school counselors um, have, have, a, have a tough job right now at most high schools because they're finding it more and more difficult to, again, create this one-on-one -on -one experience for the student. <clears throat> so an IEC works one-on-one -on -one with a student, and, and we really get to know the student really well. That's part of our job. And, and so we want to make sure that we are acting essentially as matchmakers between the student and the colleges. And we're making sure that we're figuring out who our students are, you know, what their personalities are like, what interests or qualifications or even aspirations they, may have, they might have. You know, is a school like NYU right in the heart of New York the right fit? Or, you know, would the student be better served at a place like Kenyon College, right, or at a place like Grinnell College? It's our job to really get in there and, and, and be the matchmaker. And I also think that, you know, we act as guides and interpreters for the college selection and application process. If you um, are already in practice right now working as an IEC, I, I, I guarantee that on a weekly basis, you know, you're hearing from your students and their parents um, urban legends you know, which is what I call them, you know, stories when parents go to cocktail parties, stories that the kids hear from their friends during the school day about admissions and, and how scary and mysterious it might seem for them. So I really feel like our job is to, one of our jobs rather, is to guide our students through the entire college process. Sometimes, and I think this is, this is a fair question on the next screen, <clears throat> sometimes, you know, we're asked, what the difference is between an IEC and the student's school counselor. Frequently, you'll be asked something along the lines of, you know, can, can you just take over the process? Can you just take away the process from the school counselor? And, and no, that's really not our job at all, and it shouldn't be. My hope, you know, since I've been on the other side of the desk, my, my hope, and, and some of you are actually are also in school as school counselors as well, my hope is that as an IEC, our work with the student complements the work that the school counselor is doing with the student. I really hope that we become support systems for what the school counselor and the student does together. But, you know, I also think it's okay to recognize that there are some differences um, between what an IEC does for a student and what we do, or I'm sorry, what, rather what, what an in-school counselor does for a student. So I'm sure that you, if, if asked, uh, those of you in practice can, can come up with some differences of your own. Um, but here are, I think, a few of, of, the, of the major ones that I'm seeing when I ask both my friends who are school counselors and my friends who are colleagues um, as IECs. You know, like an attorney, uh, we charge a fee for personalized service provided to each of our students. Um, you know, an IEC also has no additional day-to-day -day administrative duties like handing out detentions <laughs> to a student on campus or, you know, switching a student from period three to period five AP English. <clears throat> An IEC is allowed to focus solely on the college admissions process, which you'll remember from just a few slides ago, is now essentially a full-time career, this idea of, of college admissions. This is a 40 to 80 hour a week, you know, um, uh, career you can make for yourself. And I think, again, that's such a great thing. And finally, you know, as an IEC, we are able to focus in much more detail 
on each of our students' college application process without having to focus on external, you know, kind of what, what I call politics that come from being at a high school, whether that's dealing with admissions reps um, in, in some way, shape, or form. As a school counselor, we don't have to do that. Um, thankfully, it's one of the things that we're not um, that we're not responsible for. But um, it's important to acknowledge that our colleagues, as school counselors, absolutely have to have to deal with every day. So then, you know, I think it's good to talk about next what our job specifically entails and kind of break it down. I mean, we could spend 15 slides on, on what it is that, that we do <laughs> for, for our students as, as IECs. But for the sake of being efficient, um, I, I just threw up here on the screen um, my thoughts, um, my, my big thoughts on, you know, kind of who we are as IECs and what our responsibilities include. Um, project manager, educator, researcher, matchmaker, as I mentioned earlier as well, um, editors, and, and certainly counselors and mediators. Um, let, let me stop and just for a moment pause and say that, that I, I see some of you are asking me questions on the chat panel, which is excellent. And as Lisa mentioned earlier at the beginning of the hour, I'm going to get to those questions at the end of our Q&A session. So please keep them coming, uh, but also know that I'm not ignoring you, <laughs> but I'll, I'll get to them um, at the end. So what I would like to hear from you about currently, uh, right now on the next slide in our chat panel, is in addition to these hats, what other hats are missing from this list? What have I missed on this screen? Um, and, and please make sure to, to put, the, put that in the, in the chat panel to the right at the bottom. I'd love to know what your thoughts are here. I'm just going to take a moment to read your responses as they come in. Financial aid expert, yes, thank you. Babysitter. Um, I'm going to read off some of these other suggestions since I don't believe that the attendees can see the responses. Family therapist, yes, yeah, small business owner, entrepreneur, excellent. Somebody wrote reality check person. Yes, absolutely. I think that's a really important one to talk about. A calming presence. Yes, thank you. That's fantastic. English teacher, scholarship expert, expert psychologist, parent expectations. I always joke with um, my friends and family wh when I say semi, actually semi-jokingly, semi-seriously, that, you know, by, by, after several years in this field, you sort of earn an honorary PhD in psychology, right? Listener, an advocate and cheerleader for the student, absolutely. Help students understand where their strengths and skills coincide, I love that. College guru, I love that. Sounding board, absolutely, right? So I, I think we're all kind of on the same page, it sounds like, um, when it comes to empowering and cheerleading our students and their parents through the process. As we continue on in this discussion today, you're going to hear me um, not just include students in, in this process, but, but include their parents as well, and how as IECs, the students should take ownership of this application process, but we also have to acknowledge that as IECs, we want to take care of the parents as well along the way. Some of you might have um, your own kids who have gone through the college application process, and I'm sure some of you can remember how nerve-wracking and stressful that was. And so that's why I think when, when I use the term family here, or, or you're, you're hearing me say student and their parents, that's why. Okay, good. So it looks like everybody here has kind of contributed. Thank you for your feedback. Thank you for paying attention. <laughs> okay, so um, I'm going to go on to the next slide now because now I want to talk about the basics. And, you know, again, I wish we had a half a day together, you know, um, but for the sake of the re remaining time, um, I, I want to talk about three basic skills I hope that, that we as independent educational consultants possess 
um, in order to wear not just the hats that I put up on the screen, but the hats that all of you so wonderfully contributed. I want to start with my first of the three. And on the next slide, you will probably see something, this picture of something that you just don't recognize. But it's in phone, right? It's a phone like we used to have in the old, old days. <laughs> so the basics, number one, listening skills. OK, I know that some of you are probably thinking to yourself, this seems obvious. Obviously, we're listening to our students. But I'm going to make a case here about why I think that as an IEC, listening is such an important thing, and we don't do it necessarily always all the time in the right scenarios. Instead of listening to our families from the beginning, we often make, you know, I think two big but, but absolutely well-meaning mistakes occasionally. Um, you know, the first is, you know, we immediately want to jump in to tell our students and their parents why what they've heard at cocktail parties or on campus um, or from their friend in English class is wrong without letting the family feel heard. And the second thing up here is, is that I think sometimes we're very quick to jump in and tell our students and their parents how we're going to solve their problems immediately as well without letting them feel heard. And, and I think that you, you're going to you see the theme here on the, on the slide that we'll get to as well. But I mean, I think that um, sometimes we want to jump in and immediately solve the problem of the student and the parent right away. I mean, we're educators, right, at the core. And to, to be successful in this field, you have to love teenagers. You have to love um, the college process. And so we want to fix whatever it is, is that's hurting them or stressing them out. And so sometimes I think when we immediately jump in, we jump in too quickly. I'm sure that you can think, of, think about a time where you've gone to a friend or a husband or a wife or, or a family member when you're dealing with something stressful. And sometimes really all you want to do at the beginning is kind of vent and kind of get stuff off your chest. And sometimes do you get kind of annoyed when somebody interrupts you or when somebody jumps in too quickly and tries to solve everything for you when the reality is you just want to get it off your chest. I think that's part of what's going on here and why sometimes our, our listening skills can be better served when we fine tune them. So, you know, my, my next thought then after this previous slide is solving problems and easing anxiety are certainly reasons why a family might hire someone like us, right? And, and absolutely. So, when our problem solving and easy anxiety, or, sorry, and, and easing anxiety actually mistakes here. Um, and you heard me talk a few moments ago about kind of that example of venting to a family member or a, or a partner. But I'd also like to hear your feedback. Can you think of any other times when quickly jumping in might not be the best case, or rather the, the best strategy in that moment? If anybody has any thoughts here, put them into the chat panel on the right. Oh, right. Someone said very, very wonderfully, it's a good idea to lead kids and parents to getting to solving the problem themselves. Um, someone also, one also mentioned that when we don't have all the facts, great, right. A lot of people are writing in about how, as an IEC, a, a, a best practice is to help the student and the parent solve the problem themselves, but be their guide along the way. Oh, right. <clears throat> Someone also here wrote, uh, when parents and children are in obvious conflict, whether it's actually in front of you during a meeting, um, or maybe you're talking to a parent on the phone, that, that it's probably not a good idea to jump right in, but rather step back and let the family, or rather help the family kind of figure out how to get to the answer themselves. Somebody also wrote, I love this in all capital letters, that um, 
when the student is not taking responsibility. Yes, absolutely. Okay, great. Thank you all so much for this. <clears throat> so sometimes I, I feel like it's easy for us as IECs to forget that first and foremost, parents and kids want to feel like they're being heard. You know, they, they want to feel like they're being listened to. When, when we hear feedback from our parents who, who have heard from other parents, who have heard from other parents, you know, silly urban legends about college, admission, college admissions, um, I, I can't tell you how I just want to immediately interrupt that parent and say, nope, don't worry about it, I got you covered. Don't worry about it, I got your back. Um, but we have to really focus in on our listening skills and let them vent, let them get whatever it is they're worried about off their chest. So at the bottom of, of the slide, I think it's important to address that from the beginning, I, I really feel strongly that we should set a tone <clears throat> for our work with our families where they feel like they're being heard. So let's talk about these three bullet points um, as I think really good techniques um, to, to really practice your listening skills as an IEC. I'm sure like many of you do, um, when I am in meeting a family for the first time, I like to have what I call an introductory meeting with the child and you know one or both parents. And that's really where we get to meet each other. We get to see if there's chemistry among all of us. And so in these meetings especially, in these intro meetings especially, I'm following what I call the 80% rule, where the family talks 80% of the time. I want them to tell me what's on their mind when it comes to college. Specific colleges, are they worried about something, what do I need to know? And I really only want to be speaking at most 20% of the time. And I have found, um, in my work with my families over the years that when I do this, it really sets a calming tone for the family so that they feel like not only am I helping their student with the process of applying to college, but that I'm also there to hear their concerns. And when I can make a family feel that way, our work together is incredibly successful because listening is such a powerful thing. It's such a powerful thing. Pen and paper. All right, so again, another obvious yet not so obvious um, tool we can use to really create an environment of solid listening skills for our families. In every type of meeting, whether it's an introductory meeting or whether it's meeting number 15 with my student, I'm always writing down everything that they're saying to me, particularly interesting bullet point or uh, interesting tidbits. I, you know, I'm making bullet points on the side of my of my piece of paper because I think one of our jobs is to really write down interesting things that our students say that maybe they don't know is so interesting. Um, I think I think it's it also again creates an environment where the student feels heard, like we are the student's advocate. Really, you know, up until our students come to us, whenever they sit and meet with an adult or even talk to an adult about college, I get feedback from my students that it stresses them out, right? Um, because they're hearing how hard it is to get into college. They're hearing that they're not thinking about the right things. Sometimes they hear from adults that they're behind in whatever it is they should be doing when applying to college. So I think it's important that as the student's counselor, we become kind of the first adult they've met and come across who doesn't judge them, who doesn't make them feel behind. And one of the ways that we do this is by just, you know, making it clear that we're taking them seriously and writing down really important things that they're saying. At the end of pretty much every meeting that I try to do, uh, try, that I have with my students and sometimes their parents, I always like to recap what it is that I'm hearing from them as important at that particular day and time. Um, whether it's a particular college they want to research with me, whether it's a particular essay topic they want to they want to brainstorm. I think it's really important to repeat back to them what it is that they're hearing, or, or, or rather what it is that, that we're hearing. 
Um, and that's also just a really, I think, a really solid listening listening tool that we can give. Sometimes, you know, you misinterpret what the parent is saying. Sometimes you misinterpret what the student wants. And so when you repeat back what it is that you hear, um, it just makes all of us a team, essentially. Okay, um, so I've got about 15 minutes left in my presentation, uh, so I'm going to uh, go through the rest of these slides very quickly, um, but I'm sure that, we, that I will try to save time for Q&A at the end if anyone has anything else. Okay, so the second skill I want to talk about is organizational skills. In most of our lives, being or highly organized and being, I don't know, type A personality can sometimes stress other people out. <laughs> I know it certainly does with my friends and family, but as an IEC, be organized. It's the best thing you can do for your students. Remember that a student's anxiety about applying to college stems usually from feeling out of control feeling out of control about he or she, about where he or she will be accepted to college, right? About how to fill out a college application even, about what to write in his or her college essays. You know, when I meet with freshman families and sophomore families, I'm still surprised by how um, the college essay is the first thing that the parents bring up with me about um, uh, things that they're stressed out about. I think that's pretty an, an sort of interesting thing. So as IECs, I would like us to please embrace our type A personalities, right, and really flex that muscle um, of, of being a type A. You know, remember that knowing how to organize a student's college process is, is the most obvious way a family can see the benefit of hiring us because it's something tangible. Remember that as IECs, we are experts at the, nul, at the nuts and bolts of, you know, what goes into applying to college. Deadlines, how to use the common application, how to send SAT scores, you know, if it's right to apply early action and early decision. Um, these are, this is what we're an expert at. So I want to encourage you to really embrace your inner superhero, really embrace your inner superman or superwoman and create a personalized application timeline for your students. Um, when you do that, it really allows the parent and the student to see an actual blueprint for how to have an anxiety-free college application process, right? And again, this tangible thing that you can show off um, as, as a really excellent benefit of um, you know, working with you as an IEC. The third and final skill that I want to talk about is coaching, um, coaching skills. <clears throat> Anyone who either has a teenager, works with teenagers, knows teenagers, knows that they're wonderful, right? They're this, it's this hilarious and magical time in the life of a child being a, being a teenager, and it's my favorite age range. But there is nobody better at procrastinating dragging their feet than teenagers. So sometimes you'll find that your students kind of push the pause button unknowingly um, on various parts of the application process. So for example, you might come across a student who was registered for the March SAT and gets excited about it and then the week before decides at two in the morning to move their March SAT to the October SAT, wants to drag their feet. You might, you might come across students who are um, dragging their feet on finalizing their college list. One of the things that I see the most commonly here with the teenagers I work with is that they drag their feet on pressing submit when we complete their application in the fall of their senior year. They just don't want to do it for whatever reason. So, so why is this happening? Why are these otherwise normal and smart, accomplished teenagers dragging their feet? Let's think about this for a second. <clears throat> Parents and students have been preparing for applying to college for a very, very long time. <laughs> Some of your families, you could argue, are even have even been preparing since birth, right? You have a couple of those families, right? So, you know, whether they start with you as freshmen or they start with you as seniors, 
when they begin working with you and talking about the actual concept of college, you make it real for them. As their IEC, you come up with their application timeline, you know, whether it's their college list, whether it's brainstorming college essays, you really make applying to college for them real. So sometimes this can be overwhelming, and, and that's really what I'm seeing as, as something that can help or can, can cause families to kind of drag their feet. So, so how can we help? In my office, I have, a, I have a big sign, right, that has this wonderful quote on it um, from the University of Notre Dame, one of their football coaches, play like a champion today, right, and I make all my students hit that sign on the way out. As IECs, as I mentioned several slides ago, we wear many, many, many hats. And I think for this particular purpose, the biggest hat we can wear here for, for our students during the college process especially is to inject, you know, focus, right, and inject some common sense into applying to college. So I would encourage you to put on your patience hat, right, and make sure that you're coaching your families um, and especially your, your students to stay on track, to stay focused. I think it's really important that we coach our families and insert empowerment, and as I mentioned a second ago, common sense into their lives. <laughs> um, and, and finally, my favorite thing that I say to my students all the time, and certainly in application season, is that nobody ever died from applying to college, even though I'm sure students will feel that way. I'm sure some of us who have been doing this for a while feel that way, particularly in the months of September and October and November. Um, but, but that's uh, never happened before. No, no deaths that we know of. Um, finally, before I take Q&A, I want to go to the last slide where I, I mentioned just a few additional resources that I want to make sure you're aware of. Whether you are currently in practice or you're brand new to this field, I really want to encourage you to check out the IECA, and I put the website here um, for you to check out. Um, they are excellent at making sure that as an IEC, you are developing yourself professionally, and this is important here, so that you can then, I think, go and, and make sure that you're giving the best experience and the best ethical and quality guidance to your families. Um, and, and so that's why this is the first here on my resources section. And the last two resources up here are just two wonderful books that will inspire your families in this college process, especially because lately it seems there's nothing but scary or bad news in the media. Um, but these two books also will inspire you, I hope, as, as IECs and educators. I know that I read these books, you know, once a year, and I keep coming back to them because they just provide excellent um, kind of guidance and refocus to those of us who have been in this field um, for, for a couple years now. So gatekeepers, colleges that change lives, hooray, yes. IECA, hooray, yes. <laughs> um, so in our last about five minutes that we have together, um, I certainly want to encourage any questions that you might have about what I have said, any comments you might have any feedback that you might have about how wonderful the last 55 minutes have been in your life. <laughs> I'm open to that as well. Perfect. Thank you so much, Jennifer, for all of the, Thanks, the information that you've shared with us. It was a very robust presentation, and um, I, we really enjoyed all the, the information that you shared during the presentation. So like Jennifer had mentioned, I, Jennifer, if you want to take a moment also to go through your chat panel, um, I think yeah. at the beginning you had mentioned people were sending you questions, mm -hmm. and I know the chat panel right. may have gone a little bit lengthy since people were also, okay. and thank you all for your wonderful participation. Um, we really enjoy getting the attendees involved um, through some of the questions that Jennifer was posing to all of you, so thank you so much for your responses. And Jennifer, you want to just take a few moments. Um, I'll go mm -hmm. ahead and look through my chat panel as well and send you any Great. questions. If we don't get to your question today, I have left my email address on this slide. So please do feel free to email me with your question. I can forward it on to Jennifer and we can try to get you an answer. So in case we don't get to your question in the next five minutes, um, feel free to just shoot me an email. 
So somebody really interestingly asked here, you know, when we're working with parents and children, you know, who is the actual client, the student or the parent? I mean, if we think about it, the parent is paying for our service, right? But it's our work with our student um, that, that we're doing, or rather the student is the one who's doing the work. And that's a really great question because sometimes you'll find that there is a conflict. Sometimes a parent will say no to applying to a certain college that their daughter really, really wants to apply to. So how do we act as, or, or rather, you know, who is our boss here? Um, and so, and that's where I think the idea of kind of the, these listening skills and these medi and being a mediator can really help your work with your with your family. Um, you know, at the end of the day, I try to honor what the student wants um, if I think it's it's the right path. And I think um, it's absolutely okay to say that to the student's parent, even though the parent is, is the one who has actually paid for your services. I'm just looking here for any other questions. Anything else for me here? Is it okay to ask probing questions at the initial introductory meeting? You know, I think that's also a really good question, too. I mean, the introductory meeting serves a purpose for us to interview the family as well. We want to make sure that, you know, it makes sense for you to work with the student and that you share the student's goals. Sometimes families have unrealistic goals or expectations that you know you cannot deliver for, the, for a family. So sure, I think asking any kind of probing question that's going to ensure that you work with the student in an ethical way is absolutely okay to ask. What else, everybody? Anything else? There were a couple interesting ones that actually just got submitted, so they might be at the bottom oh, of our okay. chat panel, um, talking about students who are completely oh, uninterested in applying to college, but the parents are yeah. insisting, or parents who have this ideal institutions they want their child to attend and demands that you help them get into that specific college, even though it might not Absolutely. be in the best interest of the child. Absolutely. You know, I mean, that, that's, that's, the, that's one of the big issues you'll see, you know, when, it come, when, ethic, when ethics come into question here. You know, we, we can't do the work for our students. We can't write the essay, you know, and we also can't get a student into a college that they're not academically qualified to get into. Um, and so I think that's why having an introductory meeting, so you can kind of flesh out what's going on in the mind of the parent and in the mind of the child, is so, so helpful. And usually the introductory meeting can, can usually bring those concerns up <laughs> so that you can address it and that you as the IEC can decide if you want to work with this family or not. I very rarely say, you know, fire a family or, or I very rarely now, you know, say no to working with a family. But when I do, it is because they, the family has unrealistic expectations for what I can do for the student um, or, or what the student um, has on, you know, like is, is qualified to do. Uh, let's see. Okay. I have last. So I guess maybe the last one I have here is: What about students who want to go to college, but um, the student's parent is saying that they don't have the money to send them to college? Absolutely. That's that's something that comes up, particularly now um, in today's economy. So one of the ways that we combat that here is we have that financial conversation with the family early on. It might not need to be in the introductory meeting. Um, that might feel too personal to, to ask about. But certainly at meeting one or meeting two, when the student officially starts working with you, it's really important to have that discussion with the parents privately, you know, and say, here's the kinds of schools that I'm thinking about for your child. Um, here's what, what the tuitions will look like. Do you have any feedback for me? And let's involve the parents in that early on. So as their IEC, you're not negatively surprised if, you know, when they come to you and say, we have, we're going to have issues paying for certain colleges. It's a great question. All right, great. Well, we're going to go ahead and wrap up. If you have any questions that you think of after the webinar is over, again, feel free to send me an email. My name is Lisa. My, con my email address is on this slide. Or if you had submitted a question during the webinar, 
and we weren't able to address it, please do feel free to email those questions to me and I can forward them on to Jennifer again to uh, get you an answer. And thank you again, Jennifer, for taking your time to share all of the information today. I hope everybody that logged in gained um, insight into basic counseling skills, as well as our independent educational consultant certificate program. Again, our summer quarter classes are currently open for registration. So if you're interested in starting our program or continuing on in the program for summer, please make sure that you do register as soon as possible um, just to avoid being placed on a wait list in case since our classes do fill up pretty quickly. Um, again, this slide has my contact information as well as my directors. So if you have any program related questions, feel free to send them our way. Or if you have any questions about the webinar, uh, you can also shoot them to us as well and we can try to get you an answer. All right, thank you everybody so much for joining us today and thank you again, Jennifer. Thank you.